What's going on, y'all? The Brandon Brownson here with another episode of Theory Addict. You guys have requested it for a long time, and I think it's about time I give the people what they want. Oh yeah, it's Legend of Zelda Theories, Part 2. In Part 1, we focused pretty heavily on Ocarina of Time theories, so I thought in this episode we should tackle the other N64 entry, Majora's Mask. Since you guys have been waiting for a long time for this video, I figured I'd pack a little bit more into this episode, and to do that, I needed some help. So I got my good friend Austin to give me a hand with this one. Some of you might recognize Austin from the Harry Potter episode of Theory Addict, some of you might know him from the Chameleon Couch channel, and some of you might recognize him from the old live streams. Whether or not you do recognize him though, go down to the crotch bar and check out his channel after this video. Now before we get into the video, as always, I need to remind you guys of a few things. First of all, I did not come up with any of these theories. I am merely reading them for entertainment purposes. Second, unless otherwise noted, I do not believe any of these theories. Again, I'm sharing them to be entertaining, not informative. Last, let's try to keep the comment section civil. You guys have been doing a really good job about that recently, and I'd like to keep it that way. Basically, just don't be a dick. With that said, let's jump right into it. When playing Majora's Mask, have you ever found the Happy Mask salesman a bit odd? I mean, sure, he strangles Link and has that permanent creepy grin etched onto his face. But have you ever wondered if maybe he has a secret motive? When you first meet the Happy Mask salesman, he tells you that Majora's Mask was stolen from him by an imp, the Skull King. But what if he had actually given the mask away or sold it to the Skull King? Does that seem a little strange? Well, think of it this way. How exactly does the Happy Mask Salesman acquire his masks? Sure, he might purchase the masks from other people, or maybe he makes the masks himself. But what if the Happy Mask Salesman gets his masks in a less than honorable way? I mean, Clock Town is filled with masks. Masks which the Happy Mask Salesman could make a profit on. What if he had concocted a plan to get every single mask in not only Clock Town, but all of Termina. By giving the Majora's Mask to the Skull Kid, the evil of Majora's Mask was unleashed and Clock Town was going to be crushed by the moon. In order to stop it, Link had to get all four giants, and he was bound to pick up a few masks on the way. Once you get to the moon, you will see five children. By speaking to the kid with Majora's Mask, you begin the fight against Majora. However, speaking to the other children forces you to do a mini dungeon, and after you complete the mini dungeon, the child will then ask you to give it some masks. Now, the children all happen to look quite a bit like the Happy Mask Salesman. So what if the children were working with the Happy Mask Salesman in order to get him the masks? A few other things to point out to support this theory is that it's pretty obvious that the Happy Mask Salesman is off his rocker, so it's not too out of the blue to think that he'd be willing to put the fate of Termina on the line just to get a few more masks to sell. And one final thing, the Happy Mask Salesman thinks that the Mask of Truth is frightful. Why would an honest man find the Mask of Truth frightful? The 3D Legend of Zelda games have almost always had breathtaking scenes during the final credits, and Majora's Mask is no exception to that rule. The ending scene starts off joyously enough, but it ends on a pretty dark note. Of course, I'm talking about the Deku Butler scene. You see him, deep in the cave from the start of the game, the cave from the Lost Woods. You see him kneeling down in front of a gnarled tree, which, if you observe it at the beginning of the game, is noted as looking very sad. You see him crying over this twisted tree, which looks suspiciously like a Deku scrub. You witness this moment of dark sorrow right after the celebrations of the fourth day, and it seems very odd, very out of place, and very bitter. 
When you race the Deku Butler through the Shrine Labyrinth after completing Windfall Temple, he mentions that you remind him of when he used to race his son long ago, before the child had disappeared without a trace leaving him sad and miserable. If you recall, each of the transformation masks found in the game, with maybe the exception of the Fierce Deity Mask, are reincarnations of somebody who has died, somebody with unfinished business. The Goron Mask was a reincarnation of Dharmani, the Goron hero who died in his struggles to seal off the cold winds blowing out of Snowhead. The Zora Mask came from the legendary guitarist Mikau, who was slaughtered by pirates when he tried to rescue Lulu's eggs. However, the game never blatantly says where the Deku mask came from. Each mask, as we've just shown, comes from somebody who has died. So, who died and was reincarnated as the Deku mask? You've probably already put two and two together, but if you haven't, the theory is the Deku mask is the reincarnation of the Deku butler's son. Of course, this is just a theory, but let's look at the facts. The butler's son disappears one day after exploring the clock tower and taking the same wormhole linked in, only going into the Lost Woods in Hyrule instead of coming out of it. Around the same time that this happens, Link is pursuing the possessed Skull Kid into the caverns, and he eventually corners the masked imp. This is where some theorizing comes into play. When the Skull Kid casts his curse, he is sucking the life force out of the Deku child, who is also in the caves. This transforms the poor sapling into a weak and hollowed husk of the stump, eternally rooted into the cave. He then transfers this energy to Link, morphing the boy into a replica of himself. The Deku child was the victim of Majora's black magic, and Link was the receiver of it. This explains why Link seemed so familiar to the Deku Butler during their race through the shrine, and it also fits in with the notion of unfinished business. The Deku Butler loved his son, and his son loved the Butler, so it would have been the son's final wish to say goodbye to his father, whom he had foolishly run away from. What better way to redeem himself than in a good old race, just like old times? It was the Mask's spirit that provoked Link to do this, and it was the Mask's ultimate destiny. A lot of things in Majora's Mask are dualistic in nature. For example, the Sonata of Awakening represents awakening, while the Goron Lullaby represents slumber. Similarly, the new wave Bossa Nova is a song from birth, while the Elegy of Emptiness is one of death. Of course, this isn't only symbolized in songs. While Snowhead is getting colder, Great Bay is getting warmer. The poison in the southern swamp is slowly killing off all life, while the Kana Valley has many dead warriors rising from the grave. Hell, even the masks aren't exempt from this. The Postman's hat is a mask of freedom, while the Gibdo mask is one of confinement. Then there's Majora's Mask. Despite possessing the moon to crash into Termina, in the final battle with the mask, it uses moves and stances which symbolize the sun. Its color is also evident of this, and it's a bright, harsh purple. Of course, with all the examples of duality, Majora's Mask must have an antithesis, and it does. The Fierce Deity Mask. This mask is said to be potentially even more evil than Majora's Mask, but a quote from a Gossip Stone reveals its true nature. The Fierce Deity Mask. A mask that contains the merits of all masks seems to be somewhere in this world. The mask seems to have an opposite origin from that of Majora's Mask. It also seems to be its symbolic opposite. If you look at Link's altered shape when he wears it, a symbol of the crescent moon is seen on its armor. Also, its dominant color is a light shade of blue, again a polar opposite. Of course, the most obvious difference seems to be the effect the masks have on the ones wearing it. While as Majora's Mask seems to be sentient and controls the Skull King, the Fierce Deity Mask is a transformation, lending Link its powers. Transformation masks are all created in the same way the troubled soul of a dying person looking to find peace. So, one has to ask whom this mask came from. The theory is that the one who died, whose remains were given to you by the child wearing Majora's mask, is none other than the moon itself. 
Think about it for a moment. A mask representing the sun takes control of the moon to destroy Termina. The moon is unnaturally forced down, yet never instantly drops from the sky despite its colossal weight. It even takes a direct possession of Majora's Mask to try to force it through the grip of the four giants. Furthermore, all you have to do is look at the moon to see that it has been corrupted. With its red eyes and twisted face, you can see that it has been controlled by the power of Majora. However, it takes far too long for an object with such mass to fall. Its rotation had already been stopped, yet it takes three whole days for it to finally reach the ground, as if trying to resist gravity and to stay in the air for as long as possible. The Skull Kid even uses additional power to speed up the falling process in the last few hours. In scenes where Majora's Mask entered the moon, it was Majora's Mask that talked about consuming, not the moon. At the beginning of the game, Link had to collect the moon tears, a rock named after the way that it falls from the moon's eye. Obviously, moons normally don't cry because they are inanimate objects. However, Termina is a magical land, much like Hyrule, so it wouldn't be too far-fetched to say that the moon may also be some kind of entity. And after all, we clearly see a glowing blue rock falling from its eye. This strongly suggests that the moon is actually sad about the fate of the land, rather than willing to cause destruction. The most important point, though, is the healing process. The other three transformation masks were created by the Song of Healing, a soothing melody that heals troubled spirits. No such melody is played to attain the Fierce Deity Mask. However, a condition certainly has to be met in order to acquire it. Link means to have found every mask in the game, and then have given these masks to the Moon Children after having played hide and seek with them. The implication here is subtle, but it definitely exists. Each mask you give contains a merit, a sign of a good deed, the Fierce Deity Mask is said to contain the merits of all masks. We also know that it symbolizes the moon. Since Link is inside of it at the time, perhaps it is the spirit of the moon that these masks are given to. We know that the scene before the final battle symbolizes the Skull Kid and the Four Giants. But the Moon Children ask some weird questions, something a destruction-thirsting demon would not ask. The moon watches over all, so perhaps this scene is a fragment from the memories of the moon rather than from Majora's Mask. This could very well explain the healing process, the spirit of the moon witnessing many calamities from the sky, and ultimately the imminent destruction is a troubled soul. A simple song is not enough to heal such despair. However, Link shows to the spirit through the masks he has attained how much joy he has brought to the inhabitants of the land. The moon spirit, dying from Majora's corruption, can rest in peace, knowing that someone as strong as Link could save Termina. The moon children disappear one by one, eventually only leaving behind the child who wears Majora's mask. If Link has given up all of his masks, the child gives Link the fierce deity mask, containing the moon's corruption but merit at the same time. At this point, the spirit has died, and its mask is the only thing that remains. After the moon is defeated, the moon's empty exterior disintegrates into a sparkling rainbow of colors, and so leaves behind the world once and for all. Well folks, that about does it for Zelda Theories Part 2. Let me again remind you that I did not create these theories, I do not believe these theories, well, other than the one about the Deku Butler's son, that one seems pretty legit. And of course, if you're gonna comment, don't be a dick about it. Of course, I want to remind you to check out Austin's main channel, his gaming channel, and Chameleon Couch, a collaboration channel that the two of us are on. After a brief hiatus, he's planning on coming back full force very soon, so now is a pretty good time to catch up on his work. Links, of course, in the crotch bar. Hey. While you're down there, don't forget to like the Chameleon Couch Productions Facebook fan group, pick up my latest album, which is 100% for free, buy a t-shirt, check out all the other channels down there, and follow me on all the social media sites. But, most importantly, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. The Brandon Brownson, 
Signing out.